Hello and welcome back to my channel. I have a very special guest today. It's Steve Kaufman and I am fangirling big time right now because I've been a fan of Steve's for a very long time. He is a polyglot that speaks more than 20 languages and also the founder of Link, which is um, a great tool to learn languages through input, as I've mentioned several times on my channel already. And today I get the pleasure to talk to him. So hi, Steve. How are you? Hi, Stephanie. I'm fine. Thank you. And nice to meet you. And nice to meet someone who's been following me for so long and who also uses Link. Yeah, I I have. And I actually, I love your approach to language learning. And so today I have uh, prepared a few questions to ask you that I think would be very uh, mm -hmm. useful for my audience. So the first right. thing that I want to delve into is something that I've only heard you talk about, and that's the ability to know this. I haven't really heard it mm -hmm. um, today spoken about by anybody else. I remember you mentioned that you also heard it somewhere at a conference, but honestly, for me, you're the only one that's been discussing this. So I would love to ask you what it is and how it can be trained. Mm -hmm. uh, well, where I heard, I heard, I was at a conference, the American Conference of Teachers of Foreign Languages, something like that in San Diego. And there was a lady there who was the head of the San Diego or San Diego State University language department. And she said, there are only three things that matter in language learning. That is the attitude of the learner, the time you spend with the language and your ability to notice. Right. Uh, so I kind of used these as sort of the three keys of language learning because I, I agree with that. Uh, to some extent, the ability to notice, I think it's a, it's a function of the other two. So if you're very interested in the language, if you're motivated to learn the language, you're going to pay more attention to the language. Uh, if you spend a lot of time, uh, I think we've all experienced this sort of feeling that many things that we don't notice at first, we start to notice them later on. So as, as more things are obvious and clear to us, other things start to, you know, uh, become evident so that there is a sort of a natural increasing ability to notice if we have the right attitude and we spend enough time with the language. Uh, I also think that we have to want to notice. Uh, you know, I mention, I often mention the example for my father who was born in Czechoslovakia and he lived in Canada for 30 years, was extremely fluent in English and he would always say Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia is a province in Canada. Right. It's not that he can't pronounce SH. He can pronounce SH. He pronounces SH very comfortably if it's SH. But when it's T I A, Scotia, his, his you know, having it from Czech or whatever, the, those letters should be pronounced T I A T I A. And again, I, I, part of it could be not noticing, part of it could be just being stubborn and, and resisting the way the language is pronounced or those letters are pronounced in English. Uh, you know, for example, in Russian, you have to start noticing that those, the O that's not uh, emphasized uh, is pronounced like an A. Ah. You don't notice that at first. Uh, I can think of many examples in other languages where as we learn more things, other things become evident to us, but we also have to want to notice them. And um, not only want to notice them, we have to want to you know, apply what we notice. So, you know, th there's a tremendous tendency. Again, if we go to the example of Russian, you know, you kind of still want to pronounce the O as an O because you're trained to think of the O as an O sound. Yeah. Whereas in Russian, if it's not emphasized, as you know, then it becomes A. Ah. So I think that the uh, ability to notice is partly wanting to notice, so the attitude. Uh, it's partly having had enough exposure so that many other things in the language are clear to you and now you notice some new things. And I also mentioned that when I listen to the mini stories at Link and I listen to them over and over again when I'm learning a language, every time I listen, I notice something new that I hadn't noticed before in terms of structure or vocabulary or, or so forth. So we do start to notice more and more if we are motivated to notice. Mm. Yeah, and so, yeah, that makes sense. I've also felt how, for me, it's improved over time, definitely. Yeah, the more languages you learn, I think the easier it gets, mm -hmm. right? And so another thing that, because you have, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I get the impression that you have quite an input-based approach. 
at least in the beginning, yes. you know, to get the basics of the language, etc. So at what point do you feel that you're comfortable to start with output, with some sort of beat speaking or even writing any type of output? When do you feel like you should get started? You know, there comes a point, uh, obviously in the beginning, I focus very heavily on, on the mini stories, repetitive, you know, listening to the same material over and over again. There comes a point when you want to output. Uh, you're lonely. You want to communicate in the language. Uh, so this will typically come at about, again, the way we count vocabulary at link, 3,000, 5,000 words, something like that. Obviously, if you have an opportunity earlier, if I'm learning Persian and I come walk into a store and the store clerk is, is Iranian, I'm going to try to use my, my Persian. And when right. I lived in Japan, uh, you know, day three, if I go into a store, I'll try to, you know, use whatever little Japanese I have. But normally my strategy is to wait until I have enough so that if I get a, an online tutor that is not painful. Uh, you know, it, it's no fun having a conversation where you don't understand what the other person is saying and you really have very few words. So, and to me, that's like, I would say three months in, uh, 3,000 words, something along those lines, depending on the language. Right. And would you think that this is like a good point to to just kind of go by what you feel as opposed to when you're ready? Because I guess you'll never be completely ready, right? So just whenever you want to? Uh, yeah. Well, I think it's both when you have the opportunity right. mm. and, and when you want to, when yeah. you, you either you feel ready for it. Uh, certainly, uh, I, I, sort of, I don't think you should feel that if you don't speak, you won't learn. And many students, you know, learners have been conditioned to think that if they aren't, you know, in a classroom or if they aren't talking to someone, they aren't learning. Yeah. Uh, that's wrong. We can learn lots. We can build up our potential through lots of listening and reading, which is so much easier to organize, so much in, you know, uh, cheaper to organize. Because if you can't speak the language very well, you have to hire someone. You can't depend on passers-by right. or friends or family members uh, to help you with the language. So the input is easy to do. So why not do it? So you shouldn't feel obligated to speak. By the same token, you're never going to be perfect. So whenever you start speaking, you're going to struggle. And uh, you'll always feel that uh, even words that you thought you knew, you won't find them when you're in your conversation. Uh, words that you thought you knew, you won't understand them when you hear them in a conversation. Uh, part of a conversation is, is being familiar with sort of the, the environment of the conversation. If it's a new environment, even if you know all the words, you won't understand that well. So you have to put yourself through that sort of situation where you stumble and the second time you stumble, but the third time, the fourth time, it starts to get easier. You have to be prepared to do that. Yeah. But the decision should be with a learner. Yeah, which is actually a great break from, you know, what schools do. So I'm really glad you're saying mm -hmm. that because I at school I felt like several times I was forced to speak well, more often than For not. For sure. So, yeah, that's yeah, uh, I know. Very good message to share. And so you, you mentioned, you know, a certain number of words where you kind of feel like you're okay to start speaking, but you've also talked about before about the importance of forgetting vocabulary. So can you touch mm -hmm. a little bit on that and why you think it's so important to forget vocabulary and relearn it? Uh, several things. First of all, it's inevitable that we are going to forget. So a lot of people get upset when they forget. Uh, they think they've learned something and maybe they've studied it and they've, you know, a hundred times and yet when they go to try to use the word, they can't find the word. And uh, so it's important to recognize that when you are acquiring vocabulary, even vocabulary that comes in and then you can't retrieve it when you need it, you have still kind of put that vocabulary item into your reserve, into your memory reserve. And so to come across vocabulary once, twice, three times, four times, put it into your reserve and still not be able to, to retrieve it, you're still growing in the language. And uh, you have to put yourself into situations where you forget uh, because that's all part of the process of learning. So it's a bit of a, call it a, you know, a deliberately provocative uh, sort of statement, but it is true that we have to forget, we have to accept forgetting, 
And we have to recognize that even when we're forgetting, we are adding to our reserve we're growing in the language. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. I agree. It's, uh, it's really kind of wonderful to, to be accepting of forgetting of mistakes, mm -hmm. of all of that stuff. Yeah. And another thing... Sorry, that and I'm... I might interrupt. And that's, mm -hmm. that's one thing that's wrong with classroom teaching. Mm. We're made to feel guilty. We're made to feel disappointed if we can't remember. We get marked yeah. down on our tests. Whereas the forgetting and getting stuff wrong is such a natural part of the process. It's meaningless in terms of the eventual goal. And, but we're trained to think, boy, if we got it wrong, we're bad. Well, we're not bad. That's normal. Yeah, absolutely. And in general, I think that psychology plays a very big role in language learning. And, mm -hmm. and as does, in particular, confidence and also not being freaked out by mistakes and for forgetting, but also confidence. And right. that's something I want to ask you about because um, I know your story and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that when um, back in the day when you were f first went to Hong Kong as a diplomat to study Chinese, back then, I believe you only had studied French as a foreign language. Mm -hmm. And so you didn't have that right. experience that you have today. Right. So now right. you can be confident, of course, 20 plus languages, right. you can be plenty confident. But back then, how did you find that confidence that, you know, you knew you could do it, you knew you could go there and, and pick up Chinese? Uh, you, you know, I never doubted that I could learn the language. Uh, other people were doing it, like, why wouldn't I be able to do it? Um, I was surprised at how quickly I, can, I, I learned it, because typically it was considered a two-year course, and I did it in one year. Uh, the main reason wow. was <laughs> that the, long before I had ever heard of Compelling Input or Stephen Crash, and yeah. my approach was just massive listening and reading. Uh, other students, there were other diplomats, students from different countries learning Chinese. I mean, they would rely on their classroom and whatever the teacher assigned to them. I would go to the bookstores in Hong Kong and look for readers where you had, uh, you know, because in those days you didn't have online dictionaries. So I had to find readers that had text with vocabulary list behind each chapter. And I just read so much, so much, so much of the language came into me through my massive reading. Uh, I didn't do it because I was confident. I didn't do it because I was interested. I was interested in, I was just captivated by, by Chinese and wanting to read in Chinese. And wherever audio was available, which was not so common in those days, uh, I would be listening. So yeah. it's not a matter of confidence. It's just I sort of stumbled on or it just seemed natural to me that uh, I had to get the language in to me uh, uh, through massive input. And so that's what I did. Yeah. So I, I, I was having done Chinese when I moved to Japan. I was very confident that I could learn Japanese quite quickly. Of course. But going into going into, uh, I didn't think about. It. I learned French. I learned Chinese. You know, I'm in my early twenties. Nothing's a problem. You know. Yeah. Oh, of course. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Actually, it reminds me. It kind of happened to me with English as well because back in the mm. day when I was in school, I did so much outside of school, and that was really. A lot of yeah, listening and reading, but also a lot of TV shows. And mm -hmm. back then, I had no clue. I had no clue who Stephen Krashen was. Um, mm -hmm. Not in the way that I do now, but it was sort of a happy accident, I'd say. <laughs> Otherwise, if you know, if it wasn't for that happy accident to be interested and do so much outside of school, I probably wouldn't be talking to you today. And I'd probably be saying how school didn't work for me, English didn't work for me, etc. <laughs> so. Well, exactly. And the same is true with, with my French. Because I was motivated mm -hmm. by this professor and I got interested in French, then I watched movies and I listened to the radio and I read and I did all these things and then I went to France. Uh, and that then triggered my interest in, in learning languages. Uh, I should also say that people of your generation have the big advantage that there's so much stuff available. I mean, you can watch yeah. television programs from the States or from Britain or whatever you want, or people who are learning Spanish or Chinese or any language. There's so much stuff available on the internet, podcasts, television programs, YouTube videos. That wasn't the case 50 years ago. So right. that's a tremendous advantage. And if we ever wanted any proof that that input does it, you just have to look at the example of Sweden. 
all the Swedes speak English. It's not because they have better English teachers in the Swedish school system. I'm sure the English teachers in the Bulgarian school system or the French teachers in the Canadian school system are just as good. They study the same theory of how to teach. The difference is in Sweden, little kids grow up watching English language television from England or from Britain, from the US, and, and they, yeah. they go to school already comfortable in English. So input is absolutely the key. Great. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And so I want to switch gears a bit and ask you sure. about your, your latest languages, uh, Arabic and mm -hmm. Persian. You're still doing that, correct? Yes, yes. Yeah. Long so, struggle. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you about that, you know, how it is to learn a language very different from your own. I am myself struggling with the Abjad for the purposes of learning Persian. And it mm -hmm. seems like such a tough writing system, you know, nothing to do with learning the Latin alphabet, which of course, you know, that came easy. I think, you know, mm -hmm. Latin, Cyrillic, all of those are pretty easy, but right. I don't know, the Arabic writing script just seems so daunting. <laughs> so what do you have to say about that, about those scripts? And then in more generally about learning languages super different from, from your own? Well, um, first of all, I should correct one thing. When I say that I speak 20 languages, I have at some time spoken 20 languages. I went back into my Greek, for example, and you know, if you don't use them, you do forget a lot. I wouldn't be able to maintain a conversation in Greek nor in Romanian, for example. So you can't possibly, I can't possibly maintain all those languages, but I could quickly revive them and every, you know, all the effort that I put into trying to learn them is all, is all positive. Um, and amongst those languages, there are languages with different writing systems. And definitely the Greek or the Cyrillic uh, alphabets are less difficult. E even the Korean is less difficult because it's consistent. Obviously, the closer to the Latin alphabet, the mm -hmm. easier it's going to be. And we shouldn't yeah. underestimate the difficulty of learning a language in another alphabet. For example, I speak and read Russian. Like I, I know far more words in Russian than, say, in Polish or Czech. But it's uh -huh. still easier for me to read Polish or Czech than to read Russian because I've spent my whole life reading in the Latin alphabet. So to kind of switch over into another alphabet is very difficult. It just it's the accumulation of massive amounts of reading to train your brain in a new alphabet, even when they're quite similar, like the Cyrillic alphabet and the Latin alphabet and the Greek alphabet are actually part of the same system. They're very similar when it comes to. So Chinese was my first experience. And there, of course, you're learning three, 4,000 sort of distinct, discrete symbols. So that's a little different. With the Arabic right. alphabet, I'm finding it quite difficult. Uh, however, I'm now reading somewhat comfortably. I mean, if I look at something written in English or in a, like even I did some Turkish on Link and we have on the iOS on our mobile app now, we have this ability to, to reassemble sentences, right? And so I, if I see it in Turkish, it's instant. I, I can see the words right away. I can assemble them. I, it's just no no problem at all. With our, with Persian, I got to read it very carefully because it's just more difficult. It's a matter of letting your brain get used to it. Uh, the problem with Persian and Arabic is that it's, which is also a problem in Greek, a problem in English, the writing system is not totally consistent. So you, in some cases, you can't pronounce the word if you don't really, if you don't already know the word because there are letters there that, that could be pronounced several different ways, which is yeah. a, a nuisance. Mm. Uh, there's this issue which, which seems like a big issue when you start out, the fact that the, the individual Arabic letters might have a different form at the beginning, the middle or the end of a word. After uh -huh. a while, that's not yeah. a problem. You get used to that. Oh, so <laughs> I, I think the, bi the big message is, so, and of course, Persian is easier than Arabic because it's an Indo-European language. The language itself is not that difficult uh, compared to Arabic, for example, but the writing system is. So you just have to say, okay, when you start out, it's noise. You can't make out anything. And the writing system is just line, you know, squigglies on, a, on, on the page. Yeah. And you just have to accept the fact that with enough exposure, it, it starts to become clearer. And I definitely, like on Link, I only go in sentence mode. I wouldn't go through a whole text. It's just too daunting. If I do it in sentence mode, then it's a small amount of text. I have the translation underneath. Uh, you know, I can look up each word, I can pronounce, especially if it's properly time stamped, I can hear it. And so going through it in sentence mode kind of breaks down the difficulty. But I realize that I just have to put more and more Persian into my brain. And uh, slowly it'll get, uh, it'll get better, but it takes time. 
Hmm. That's very comforting to know that, you know, <laughs> eventually it'll work out because I'm such a beginner. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it takes a long time and, and it seems very daunting, but it's, it's, there's no shortcut. It's just massive mm -hmm. listening and reading. Yeah. And to ask you about the Slavic languages, this is also mm -hmm. what I wanted to do because I get a lot of questions as a native Slavic speaker, you know, what is the easiest Slavic language to learn or what is the best to begin with to ease mm -hmm. you into the Slavic world? And I, I really don't know because, uh, you know, being a Slavic speaker is like, how can you judge your own languages? Right. And I've also never really studied other Slavic languages except mm -hmm. now with Russian. But that's pretty much it. I was always about the Romance languages. I was mm -hmm. kind of ignoring my own language group. <laughs> and yeah, what would you say as somebody that has studied quite a few Slavic languages? Well, I think it, it depends on your motivation. Uh, there is no objective reason why you should learn Russian rather than Bulgarian. If you're moving to Bulgaria, then, or you have a Bulgarian friend or relative or partner, then that's the language that's important to you. Uh, obviously, Russian has the largest number of native speakers. Um, I've heard, because I haven't done Bulgarian, that Bulgarian doesn't have cases. So that yeah. would be a big advantage with Bulgarian because cases, case endings, is one of the most difficult things to get used to in all Slavic languages. Basically, Slavic languages, to me, they have two areas of difficulty. One is the case endings. Not, not to understand why, but to try and remember the endings on the fly while you're speaking. And the second yeah. difficulty is verbs. Uh, I, I, I'm assuming that the same is true in Bulgarian. They have these verbs of motion, depending on whether you go and come back or go and go somewhere else or go on a form of transport. So then you get a different verb. And also the sort of aspects of verbs, this idea which, you know, uh, at any rate, verbs present some area of difficulty. But difficulty in any language is less important than your degree of motivation. So it really depends on why you want to learn the language, which language you're motivated to learn. Russian literature is better known than Polish or Czech or Bulgarian literature for a variety of reasons. So Russian has kind of become the sort of the star amongst the Slavic languages. If you're going to learn a Slavic language, everybody has to learn Russian. There are arguments in favor of learning, say, like Ukrainian, uh, Czech or Slovak, Polish, their vocabulary is more similar to each other than to Russian. So Russian vocabulary is kind of the outlier. I don't know. I've heard that Bulgarian vocabulary is closer to Russian. I don't know. So it might be easier to learn that sort of Central Eastern European group of languages, but none of that really matters. What matters is which you are most motivated to learn. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say the case is certainly that's a big advantage of Bulgarian, but unfortunately we have articles that we stick at the end of the words and we have quite a few versions of them. So I think that's the... <laughs> The, the issue there but yeah it makes it really makes sense to you know think of where your interest lies of course right. um but then also yeah interesting i had no clue about you know ukrainian being closer to polish and czech that's uh, in terms that's of vocabulary in terms of vocabulary yeah yeah right so that's very interesting mm -hmm. uh, but but in the, general, uh, the grammatical structure in, is very similar amongst all those languages yeah mm. the basic principles of grammar are kind of the same Mm -hmm. But the vocabulary, that one group, the sort of Polish, Czech, Slovak, Ukrainian group is closer. Yeah. Well, that's great to know. Well, thank you so much for your time. I okay, learned a lot. I enjoyed it. And I hope my viewers did too. Yeah, oh, I All right. certainly enjoyed it as well. And I did. let's continue over on your channel. Okay. Where we can pick up the conversation yeah. again. Okay, so. Yeah.